This video is the introduction to the NEC. I'm going to get real with you. I've been recording this video over and over and over and over. And I'm kind of tired of it already. So here we go. Safety. That's what the code is about. Why is it about safety? Well, it's about safety because the codes were written based on people getting hurt or killed or property being damaged because of something that somebody else did electrically. That's why the codes were written. Another good reason for having a code is so that everyone is working towards a standard. Could you imagine if everybody were allowed to come up with their own codes? It'd probably just do whatever's easy. Probably not a good thing. So now we all have to work up to a standard. That standard though is the minimum that's required. Yeah, I know. It seems like we have to do a lot of stuff and it's only the minimum. Imagine if you went over and above. Whew. I don't know. It would cost a fortune. But it does keep us all in line. And that's important. Because when you do a job, whether you're doing it for the company or... I'm not going to say side work because I'm not supposed to talk about it. But say you were doing it on the side for your family, yeah, you still need to follow the code. And that's going to keep you in line. Let's get into Article 90. The purpose of Article 90 is what? I think we discussed it in the last class. It's the practical safeguarding of people and equipment. We're trying to keep people from dying and equipment from exploding. That's what we're doing. So what's the intent of the code? Well, the code book also tells us that. The intent is this. It is not an ABC 123 design and installation manual for untrained people. But you know what? <laughs> We're not untrained. So we don't have to worry about that, right? It is a good guide for me and you to actually take and abide by. And it does help us install things the way that they need to be installed safely. So the most important part of this article, 90.2, hmm, what could that be? How about the scope? That's probably the part of every article that you've never read or never even thought to read. Well, the scope is super duper important. Why? Well, think about it. You got to hit what you're aiming at. That's what a scope is for, right? You get your rifle out, you aim at a deer, you use a scope, it's got to be right on, it's got to be accurate, it's got to be calibrated, it's got to be ready to go. You're not going to hit what you're aiming at. Well, if you don't look at the scope in the article that you're in, you may not be hitting what you're aiming at. You might find a code article that seems to apply to your situation, but you may be completely in the wrong code article. You know what you can do? Look at article 225 and article 230. Two completely different articles that talk about two completely different installations, but the codes are pretty much the same. So guess what? You answer with article 225 code on your code test when it should have been 230. Even though it reads right, it's going to be wrong. Scope. It's important. So the scope tells us what's covered. What is covered? Well, houses. That's what we're doing. It also covers like carnivals and, yeah, I know that's weird, huh? Carnivals. But whatever. And it covers lots and yards and buildings and, you know, things that normally we would think that it would cover. The things that it does not cover, well, how about ships? Never wired a ship. And aircraft. Never wired an aircraft. And mines either. Or automobiles. Doesn't work for this. Somebody else has another code standard for that. If you want to figure out how to find things in the code, one, one, one of the best things you can do is this. Understand how it's arranged. It's arranged in chapters. Chapter 1, what does that tell you? I'm going to tell you. Chapter 1 tells you that you have some general requirements that you must follow. The first thing that it talks about is this. Definitions. Second, installation requirements. Unbelievable. Can you... 
general requirements. How about wiring protection? Well, that's chapter two. And we'll see a lot of that article for grounding. We'll see that for branch circuit conductors and for services. We'll use that, that chapter constantly. Chapter three is wiring methods, and there's a lot of stuff in there, especially table 310, 15B, 16. That is our go-to number one table that we're always looking at. And that's the table that where you're going to hear me talk about 60 degree, 75 degree, 90 degree table. And it also has a heading, which is kind of the scope for that table. And we will be talking a lot about those things. How about number four, chapter four, equipment for general use. Lights, motors, all kinds of things in that chapter for us in residential. All four of those chapters put together, though, generally apply to all electrical installations. So no matter what kind of wiring that you get into as an electrician, you're going to be going through chapters one through four quite a bit. Another chapter that we will use every once in a while will be chapter six, which is going to talk about pools and hydro massage bathtubs. It's, it's a pretty good article, especially when you're putting in that kind of stuff. You really need to understand how to ground and bond those kind of things. You don't want anybody dying next to a pool. And then chapter nine, tables. We'll use that every once in a while, but most of the time that, that thing gets used for voltage drop because we want to understand our conductor properties. And that's what we're going to find in table nine. And then we'll go to Annex C. Annex C is an informational note, but it's a really good place to go to let us understand conduit fill for the type of wire and the type of conduit that we're putting in. So let's go to my favorite article and probably every inspector's favorite article and that's 90.4. It says the inspector is God. Well, I don't really say that, but it's kind of what it means. It calls the inspector the authority having jurisdiction, which is whoever can red tag your job. Well, it goes on to say in that article that it is up to them to interpret the code the way that they see it. So don't argue with them. If that's what they want, that's what they get. We move on to Article 90.5. That is rules that we have to do. What are those rules? Those rules say shall and shall not. Yeah, mandatory rules. You have to do it or you can't do it. The next set of rules that you're going to see in the code are permissive rules, which are shall be, shall not be, which are maybe or maybe not. Well, then we head into informational notes, which I told you is basically what all the annexes are. But we'll find informational notes all throughout the code, which are pretty much notes to give us best practices. They used to be called FPNs or fine print notes. They are now called informational notes. So my absolute, I'm lying. It's not my absolute favorite article, but it's a good one. Article 100, definitions. Yeah, they are really, really important. You know, you and I, we probably don't see eye to eye on, on words we use sometimes. And the code definitely wants to make sure that we are all on the same playing field. So what it does is it actually des describes and defines a lot of words uh, in relation to how they're used into the code. Let me give you an example. Well, maybe not a code example, but a good example about why definitions are good. My son, when he was in high school, one time wanted to stay out, well, a little bit later, but he said he'd be home early. So I told him, sure, that's fine. I'm thinking, you know, 12 o'clock, no, his normal curfew was 11, so if he's home by 12, I'm happy. 12.30, I give him a call, and hey, bud, where you at? Well, I said I'd be home early. Well, it's 12.30. Oh, yeah, 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 I didn't realize it was that late, but yeah, I'll... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm leaving just a, just a few minutes. So I'll be home in a bit. 1.30, no kid. Call him up. Oh, yeah, I was still talking to my buddies. I told you I'd leave in a little bit. 
Well, you see, my definition a little bit, his definition a little bit, completely opposite. My addition of, hey, you know, be home early, not his definition. So what is your definition of something being accessible and something that's readily accessible? Really kind of sound like the same thing. But go to your code book and find out because I want to talk about those two things in the next class. Let's also talk about these six words that we usually use incorrectly. How about outlets? Have you ever went somewhere and somebody said, hey, go put in all the outlets? They weren't telling you the truth. It was wrong. Wrong words. They're receptacles. Or how about, hey, run that feeder over there for the air conditioner. Well, feeder may not be the right word for that, depending on what you're connecting to on the other side. How about ground that or bond that or grounding and bonding? Kind of sound like the same thing. We, we use them interchangeably, but they're not. And we always say the hot wire, the neutral wire, the ground wire. Yeah, that's not right either. Yeah, it's, it's the ungrounded, the grounded, and the grounding wire. Yeah, pretty confusing, huh? Try to read that in a code article where they're using all three in the same article. It is crazy. You got to start like taking notes to figure out what they're talking about. Yeah, you didn't realize it maybe, but the code is written in legal language. Yeah, they make it even difficult for us to understand. And then what about a ground rod? Hmm. I'll bet you're really not going to find ground rod, but you're probably going to find grounding electrode in the code book. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't get it either. But once you start to understand how words are defined and how we use them, you'll definitely be able to use the code book a lot better. So let me tell you this. Take a look at these things that I talked about today. Take notes. And then I'll see you next class. Be safe.